Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. This is uh, Marty Otanez, and today we have a special guest, David Wiseman, and we're going to talk about some advocacy that he's been doing and how it relates to uh, emerging advocacy in the cannabis sector. Welcome to the show, David. Well, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the chance to talk about it. Making clear, of course, that the two areas of advocacy are distinctly different uh, in terms of their uh, subject matter and goals, but that we may be able to share some common techniques and strategies that can be used between the two. We never yeah, advocate them, never advocate the mixing of cannabis and nuclear power at the same time. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about um, who you are, your background, and where you are? Well, as we speak this morning, I'm, I'm talking to you from Morro Bay, California. It's a small fishing village halfway between Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco. I, uh, I'm from New York City. I went to the New York University Film School. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I uh, found that documentary filmmaking did turn out to be my uh, particular passion. It always had been, even as a child. I preferred the, uh, the nonfiction movies, the Disney nature documentaries, and that kind of stuff to, to make-believe. I, I would rather go someplace and see real things than go to the circus or something, or something like that. I uh, kind of left Los Angeles, maybe to clear my head from that, and come to this little fishing village that I had liked so much. And when I arrived, I found out I had known, but didn't really know, there was a nuclear reactor 11.3 miles from my living room window. And um, I had neither been necessarily for or against nuclear power, but in my series, we did an episode on nuclear waste, and we filmed here locally. And that's when I began to discover what an intractable problem the waste was going to present. I mean, no solutions, really. And I arrived here in this town, and... Uh, was going to paint and do poetry, but I saw in the local alternative weekly paper, it said, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission's coming to town like Wednesday night, March 21st, 2001, to meet at the uh, library to discuss the waste storage. And I thought, well, I'll go to this meeting because I'm new in town. I've just moved here. If I speak, it'll be a way to uh, let the public know who I am. I've made a film about nuclear waste. We filmed in Yucca Mountain, Nevada, in the hole in the ground where they want, or think they wanted to bury it. So either I might um, let the town know about my video skills or, you know, meet women. I am shameless in admitting that. And I went to this meeting, which was packed, overflowing. I did not expect it. I had not experienced grassroots activism. I had dealt with interviews, with the academic, with the scientific community. And here I come to a meeting where speaker after speaker is pouring their heart out about the passion they bring to these subjects. I was overwhelmed. I said, well, I, I can have nothing to say. I mean, what can I, I, I can't. Well, I did have something to say. I had, I had done one of the techniques, which is if you don't know the subject fully, enlist an expert. And I had said, what's a good question to ask these folks tonight? And I had it written on a little piece of paper, a multi-part five clause question. So I was the last person to speak because I got there late. I didn't expect a crowd. And I gave my, my question and the fellow from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission paused. There was like, you could hear a pin drop. And he said, that's quite a lot of question there, young man. And I said, I can wait. And um, I think the reason there was a pin drop was because so much of what we had heard before, heart felt as it was, was heartfelt. But I, ha I was actually looking for numbers. I actually wanted concrete information. Some data. Yes. And, uh, and I, I found the only empty seat I could find, and I sat down between these two women. And the first one turned to me and said, who are you and where did you come from? And the other one said, never mind, I saw him first. Well, the first one was the county supervisor, and the second one is still my boss today. And that's how I got enlisted into, into working on this, uh, on this subject matter. And um, I continued freelance documentary work. I did an entire project on the environmental movement in Texas. But slowly, more and more of my day. You know, what, what makes someone do this? That, that's a question. Um, maybe it was a good fit for the skills. Uh, advocacy and successful documentary filmmaking share that in common. You want to create an argument using the best empirical evidence you can find, established in a way that uh, flows in a logical A to B to C to D purpose that takes the person uh, along so they can understand your point of view, 
and have evidence that stands up to scrutiny. So, so David, it seems like you've had some success integrating your videography with your advocacy. Is there any kind of clip you could share with us that might give viewers sort of um, uh, tangible material for them to think about um, based on what you've just shared with us? An example of video work uh, that I've done while doing this work is using other people's footage. That is to say, it's not an original video. I am a collector of video, a compiler, if you will. It's sort of like what The Daily Show does with their news clips. Uh, this is one of the few creative outlets I've had. Most of our work is bureaucratic. It's dealing with papers, documents, etc. But this was a fun video thing. The earthquake faults here on the coast of California pose a threat to the nuclear power plant. They always did. They were the Achilles heel in the beginning, and they remain a question now. To put the people's fears in mind after the Japanese disaster of Fukushima, the utilities and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided we will conduct the most robust scientific research and uh, discussion ever to get to the bottom of what the earthquake fault is. And they brought out the top, top scientists. And this went on for a couple of years. We'd have these three-day, four-day workshops separated by several months where the top experts would come and tell us why this was safe. And they kind of gave short shrift to the people who were the doubting Thomases in the room. Well, we began to notice a bit of a corruption of the scientific process here. See, this is, this is part of it. You, you look at it and realize, wait a minute. How come the people who are giving the presentations on behalf of the electric company are also the same people who are serving as the peer review panel for these Conflict studies? Of Conflict of interest. Now, and their claim as well, it's such a narrow field and so specialized, we couldn't get enough experts. And we were like, hmm. And I thought, I know there's something in this, having sat through 24 hours of meetings. And they were videotaped at our insistence by public access. So I had 24 hours of footage to watch and catalog. And in it, I had to find all the juiciest conflict of interest moments. So I took them, after much culling, and I combined them into a small witty video uh, we call Red Hat, Blue Hat. And it's just two minutes long. And in two minutes, I managed to dismantle any scientific credibility that they might have possibly had. And the point of that is we use this video whenever there's a meeting of the Energy Commission, the Public Utilities Commission, the Safety Commission. And I get three minutes of public comments. I have one minute to introduce the video and two minutes to run it. Enough said. How can one person wear different hats? Isn't there some fundamental cognitive bias uh, if someone is a, both a proponent expert plus putting on an integrator hat? So that's why we have these hats so that we understand what role we're playing at any particular time. And it's my responsibility if someone forgets to bring up their hat like Norm Abramson to walk up there and give him his hat. Uh, I know these are symbolic but it's critical for the audience to understand what perspective I'm presenting up here. Got my red hat here, I'm ready to go. So I ought to put on my other hat and stop being a proponent. I, as a, you know, <laughs> as a geologist, I guess I am a proponent expert now, right? I will tell you that have to uh, take off my evaluator hat and put on my proponent. So I'm going to take off my proponent hat. I now as a technical evaluator. Hats, you can take off your PE hat now. For a site-specific study in, in my mind, looking at this, uh, because the state is not being released, I just want to, you know, I've taken a measurement. Yeah, but this, this those who want to stay are, are welcome. I don't know how that would happen. I was allergic to a lot of what I've been hearing. There's no confusion in roles. They are normal separation faults. Thanks, Stu. That was 
Slip rights are not well constrained. I think we're all talking the same language, but just using different... I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> One of the things we did with this uh, video clip was, first of all, for our group, which is not a, we're not a tech savvy group, we're a small, very finely tuned group that looks at a very specific issue. It goes, if we get 1500 hits, that's viral for someone like us. The important thing is the people hitting or watching it are decision makers, key decision makers on the issue. This isn't a mass marketed video, it has a specific audience. Two, it really undermined the confidence of the scientists themselves. In other words, I got in under their skin a little bit on this one. Um, and three, we can't be, while we can be accused of, well, they selected and cherry picked moments. Well, of course, it's a comedy clip. But all 24 hours of the material that it was drawn from are available online. If you believe we have portrayed something inaccurately, all the source material is there for you to look at and come to your own decision. So this was just our chance to um, get the decision makers, people who only have a two minute time frame, to understand that you have just spent $60 million on a seismic research study project that's bogus. What's the problem with, with that nuclear power plant? I mean, for some people, nuclear energy is like the savior and it's gonna help um, resolve our, our problems. So what's the problem with it? And then can you talk about any um, success you've had in actually building accountability in this um, area? When one looks at nuclear power, you know, the, the litany of problems go back to the 1960s. It creates waste for which we have no solution. It's potentially dangerous. There can be a meltdown. We've seen the disasters. Um, there are effects from radiation, from uh, biological health hazards in surrounding areas, perhaps. Um, litany of health safety concerns. But there was always also one Achilles heel. When nuclear power was introduced to the public in that famous speech in the 50s, it was described as power that will be too cheap to meter. And that never happened. The Achilles heel is actually the money. It turns out to be super expensive. The nuclear reactor where we live was originally budgeted at $360 million. That's before they bothered to find out about the earthquake faults. And then they had to redesign, and then they redesigned it wrong and had to rip out the rebar and rebuild it again. So it went from $360 million to $5.7 billion. So a disaster uh, project. It's a disaster in my pocketbook, not my health. Now, much of nuclear advocacy and what engages the public is, I hesitate to use the word, but there's an alarmist sense of danger, radiation, meltdown. Mm -hmm. Our issue was bankruptcy. If you're looking for a strategic trend, we took the alternative argument. Instead of following the traditional path of opposing it because of the health, the safety, the radiation, we took the economic point of view. It's simply too expensive. This arose when uh, my boss, she decided, traditional organizations had been fighting the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission to oppose nuclear power for decades. And where were they getting? If you don't succeed on that playing field, change venues. Forget the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We don't prevail. We brought the issue back to our state, the state of California. And because we made the issue money, we went to the state agency, the California Public Utilities Commission, which is overseen by the state legislature, people we elect, not appointed Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners in Washington, D.C and said, let us assert local home jurisdiction over this issue. And we've had great success. That's what, by moving it from the traditional arguments to a newer argument or a different argument, economics, by moving the playing field from a federal agency in Washington that was intransigent to a state agency, where if we don't like what they're doing, we'll lobby the legislators to replace the commissioners. And so what would be in the um, uh, recent period uh, something you've been proud of in terms of a, an example of a successful um, achievement you've had with the advocacy you're involved in? With regulatory agencies, um, I would have to say we've arrived at a year ago, June of 2016. We were invited to be a party by Pacific Gas and Electric, the electric company, 
to a landmark agreement to shut the nuclear plant down in a controlled phase out over the next half decade or so. The utility realized they're losing money on it. Renewable energy, the stuff that the opponents always said, there'll never be enough sunlight and the wind doesn't always blow. Maybe. But there's enough of it now that it's actually happening. The alternative energy revolution, rooftop solar, wind farms is actually happening. The electric company realized it. They can't make as much money on this nuclear plant anymore. It costs money to repair. It's large and cumbersome. It's not flexible. Right? We're in a flexible world now. We've got cell phones anywhere instead of the old landlines. But the electric industry hadn't quite changed from a top-heavy, top-down system to a flexible distributed system. The paradigm is shifting. They realized the time had come. So they invited us along with other, other groups, some other environmental groups to come together. We, I guess, represented more of the ratepayer economic group. Others were more of the renewable energy groups and said, let's get together. We'll close the plant down. We're going to want some stuff like your money to pay the workers and to pay off some debts. And uh, fine, if it means the end of nuclear power, and this is another part of it is willingness to compromise. I really think the work we've been doing, when you have an issue as divisive as nuclear power, and I'm not saying that's way up there with capital punishment or abortion, but it's, it's not there, but it's on the next level down. GMO crops, things like that, right? It's, it's there. Yeah, it's an issue that has traction. Track. The, we got together and the negotiations were long and difficult. Who wants this? Who's willing to give that? But if we stood at the absolute polar opposite ends and just continue to have that we're right, we're right thing, realizing that the successful place can be in the middle. I mean, we've lost that. Compromise became a dirty word. And to be sure, there were some very harder core environmental and other groups who would consider us traitors. We want the plant shut down now. On the other hand, you have the pro-nuclear and the utility workers saying, we want this plant to get an extension of 20 years. So it's, we want this thing to go 20 more years. And then on this side further here, we have, well, we want it shut down tomorrow. And we were part of a group uh, that came together to say, how about this? Shut it down in about seven or eight years. So what are the other kinds of skills or talents that you have that make you a good advocate? One of the most effective things, the key thing is your credibility especially when you deal in a venue where you're dealing with regulators and legislators. Your word has to be impeccable and the work and the research you do has to be flawless. If you're asked or you're proposing legislation, for example, you, you, in, your, in your field of endeavor, you need legislation to change some laws and you present evidence, you better be careful because if you have given a senator or an assembly representative the wrong thing to say in a speech and it comes back to bite them, you will never be called upon to provide that information to that legislator again. And you'd better validate and verify your sources. Now, when it comes to the information, a part two of that is very often, well, we have a study that shows this and they have a study that shows that, right? And everyone has their studies and that's the evidence you're going to use. What I have found, and again, it goes back to using those video clips of nonfiction information. It's, it's the best evidence is their own words. Now, this, right. is the, this is the needle in a haystack work. Remember, John Stewart had dozens of people back there in The Daily Show going through every clip of everything every politician ever said. And that may become your work going back through every speech and everything they said, because when someone's saying this now, well, sir or ma'am, you said this, but now you say this. I'm hearing two conflicting things. Now it's not you having to make an affirmative case. It's they now being forced to defend their case. Well, how did you say this then? You said this later or before. Which is it? So building off of what you just said, if a student in a university or a community member wants to get involved at a deeper level, whether it's um, against nuclear energy or to build accountability in, in the cannabis sector, what would be some advice you'd give to them so they could um, uh, be effective? Make sure that you, you, you dig through the reports. Um, a lot of people don't like this work. I'll never forget the first time we had to deal with a nuclear issue, spent fuel, and a hearing. 
And here's this binder for a public of hearing. And I'm sure there are public hearings that come up on this other se sector as well. And I looked at it and said, I don't even know where to begin. What am I even looking for? And, and my uh, boss said, just start reading. All right, turn page one and you start reading the executive summary. You're reading the executive summary and I'm like, okay, and I'm circling things, but I don't know what I'm going for. Then you get into the actual body of the report. And about 12 pages in, I actually find something. I'm like, this rings a bell, wait a minute. And I go back and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. In the executive summary, they said such and such would happen in three months, but here they say it's six months. And I learned a key thing that was later, I was naive, told to me by veteran activists. What the government or the regulators put in the executive summary very often differs from the body of the research, but they don't expect wow. anyone to go that far back into it. This becomes part of, as you said, flipping it. When you used the phrase earlier, flipping it, that's what judo is, throwing their own weight against themselves. So I would suggest that, that is a key way of deriving evidence. Um, a second thing we have done and attempted to make a point of is don't spend too much time preaching to the converted. They already agree with you. It's very nice to speak to a crowd of people who already love you and your work and to receive the accolades and the, you know, the applause, I guess. But in our case, to speak to the Sierra Club is a guaranteed response. Try making your presentation to the Elks Club, the Kiwanis, or the Rotary Association, especially if you're looking to increase a business. Have you done outreach to groups like Rotary International, Kiwanis, Chamber of Commerce. Now, that is walking into the lion's den and you really need to, you know, maybe have a quick belt of scotch before you step into that you venue. You got to know your stuff. You got to know your stuff and have the data. And make sure that the way you phrased your argument is aligned with the types of things they're looking for. Don't come preaching to them about one set of things when you know their interest is economics, jobs. That's why the Rotary Club is there. But having allies who are your non-traditional allies, not seeing them as the enemy, but as people who may have a common goal. We look to find what we have in common with a group first before we decide what we oppose them on. Earlier, David, you mentioned you're not working alone, you're with a group, and I don't think we got you to tell us the group's name oh. and a little bit about the group and how could people learn about the, the group? Right, it's the uh, Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility and it's at the web at uh, A4, the number 4, nr.org. What it is, is that we were formed in January of 2005 as a spin-off. Prior to the alliance, the key group in this region dealing with the nuclear issue was the Mothers for Peace of San Luis Obispo, formed back in 1969, I mean, at the original licensing of the nuclear power plant. And never underestimate the determined group of people who really fought quite valiantly raised the issues. It's because of the Mothers for Peace that opposition was filed to the reactor in the first place, that the construction was delayed because the earthquakes, I mean, there was an enormous amount of work done. It also was the site, San Luis in the early 1980s, of the largest 40,000 people public demonstration in all of California uh, during this movement. Jerry Brown came in in a helicopter. So they formed, but as I say, uh, the woman I work with, Rochelle Becker, had been their spokesperson. And around the time George Bush got elected was when she began to realize, we're not going to have a lot of luck maybe at the federal government now. And that's when she began to evolve that strategy of let's shift this to the state. Let's assume local control over this issue. And so the alliance was a split off. Rochelle and I kind of split from the Mothers for Peace, who are still in existence and actively engaged in all these cases. But they didn't do Public Utilities Commission. They did Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so when we decided to make it a pocketbook issue rather than a safety issue and move it from the federal to the state, hence our organization uh, went in that direction, which also included legislation. We're not just a 501c3, we're a 501c4 as well with the funds specifically that are not tax deductible for legislative work. And we actually passed with the help of uh, legislators Legislation that has led towards this goal. Legislation that required them to do earthquake studies. Legislation that attempted to uh, bring these issues. Sometimes it's a small bill, but it keeps it before the legislator's eyes. It lets it not be forgotten. And I have to say too, we got more legislation passed with Republican legislators in, wow. in blue California than, uh, than with, and then we have Democrats now representing the district. 
uh, which shows you we made it a bipartisan issue. By making it an economic issue, we made it a bipartisan issue. By August 2018, is there a goal that you hope to have met in the next 12 months? And tell me about that and how you're going to achieve that goal. Well, right now, the process uh, to bring the reactor to a successful retirement over the next, between now and 2025 at the latest, uh, is in a process at the Public Utilities Commission. It requires the stamp and signature of the Public Utilities Commission to say, yes, we'll ramp down the reactor, we're going to pay the utility this much for the workers' compensation and um, uh, the pay to keep them engaged. Um, we're going to pay the local community possibly this much money to make up for the lost revenue. We're going to obtain or procure this much re renewable energy to replace it. All those details are at the Public Utilities Commission now. That process could go through the end of 2017, and hopefully the Public Utilities judges and commissioners will approve that process. Once that's done, we can begin in 2018 discussing the decommissioning. And so sometime in 2018, we'll begin having meetings to discuss, okay, it's going to end. What's the land going to be used for? What is going to be the status of the waste that's left behind? And so the decommissioning would begin to be the discussion in 2018. The important thing is the Alliance's original goal, if you look at our mission statement, was to educate the public about nuclear power and nuclear waste, but also prohibit license renewal extension of California's two existing seismically co-located reactors. That was the goal. It wasn't to shut them down today or tomorrow. It was to keep them from getting relicensed for another 20 more years. David, um, we're a bit out of time, um, okay. but I think the discussion we had today, which was um, you know, to just sort of learn from your experience uh, with the advocacy you're doing and see if others could learn from it and then apply it to the, the cannabis sector. So um, one more time, how can people reach you? Like what's the website? And uh, any closing comment or remark you want to share yeah. with us? WWWA for the number four nr.org and i'm david at a four nr.org uh you're welcome to visit our website we it's public open transparent that's a big thing too transparency very big um and i would just say you know advocacy is is something i did not study i didn't go to a school for public policy or social research i can't even say that opposing nuclear power if you will was a burning desire. I love trains. I'd have much rather had a career promoting rail, transport, and light rail. Now that I would passionately love. I'm never unhappy on a train. And yet, here was a chance to take some skills I had, and it is a place I live as well. So yes, there's something about I live here. Do I not sleep at night because of the reactor? No, I sleep at night. Um, I believe and hope they're doing their best to keep it safe. But I realize also it's coming out of my pocket. And that's where I engage the issue. And, um, you know, I, can I counsel it as a, as a career? I'm, I'm not sure. And I don't know where the future will find me. But um, it certainly has been uh, a remarkable 16 years now that I hadn't planned on at all. And in retrospect, have, uh, have no regrets.